Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto turns into a fox during a full moon. Pre-timescoop, no biju, Kanaha is a village of ninjas who hunt demons. Naruto is a ninja with secrets. And tonight is the night of a full moon. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 22, Papa Wolf, Mama Fox. The Umbu codename, Mangetsu had to use all of his stealth to slip into the Uchiha district without being noticed. Regardless of his mission, if any Uchiha caught him trespassing they would drive him out and complain very loudly to the Hokage. So he was quick and careful and had he not had a good idea of where his target was headed, he would have lost Byaku Chikashoka while keeping out of sight of the Uchiha clan. He managed to catch up just as Fugaku arrived home for lunch. When the clan head and the Uzunin walked around the house to the backyard, he made a wide loop around to the same area and took a post in a tree at the very edge of the yard. The dense leaves gave him excellent cover on all sides, but also made it so that he could barely see a thing outside of his hiding spot. So he depended on his ears instead. Within moments his ears had changed shape from the usual human form into furry triangular ears, one cocked towards the conversation between the Uchiha and the foreigner and the other facing away to be alert to possible threats. And he listened to every word that they said so that he could later relay it all to the Hokage. My wife was close friends with Uzumaki Kushina and she was quite excited to be having Sasuke at the same time as she was going to have her first child. You may not know the woman personally, but have you heard anything about her or her child? That really caught his attention. He briefly wondered why on earth Fugaku cared because his child was dead. Then he shoved the fleeting thought aside and listened even harder. The less said about either, the better. I never cared much for the woman myself. But anything at all about her would mean a lot to my wife. There's really nothing good to say. Your wife would be much happier knowing nothing. This boy, Naruto, he reminds me very much of Uzumaki-san. That name almost knocked him out of the tree. It was the same name that he and Kushina had pulled out of the advance copy of the book that Jiraiya had sent him mere days before his first transformation and subsequent desertion. Unless Kushina had changed her mind after he'd gone, that was his child's name. He wanted to look at that picture that Fugaku had so badly. But he stayed in the tree and listened, now with both ears, as his muscles cramped with tension and his blood burned with adrenaline. Well. Uzumaki Kushina birthed a son with strange markings on his face. And soon it became clear that he had inherited lycanthropy. The village demanded that the creature be disposed of, but she delayed and refused. Eventually, long after the problem should have been dealt with, Clan Uzumaki claimed that the creature had been taken care of. That name and that face, though. I'm very sorry to say it but seems like Clan Uzumaki may have lied. He felt his heart stop. It wasn't for sure. But the possibility, no matter how remote. And the fact that they were discussing this meant not only could Naruto be alive, but he could be here in Kanaha. And, should this boy test positive for lycanthropy, I hate to ask you to clean up my village's mess. His jittery elation froze in his veins. You weren't the ones to sweep the problem under the rug. He glared at the screen of green leaves that prevented him from glaring at the two conspiring ninjas. It should have been dealt with swiftly and properly. That boy could have bitten someone and spread the disease. His teeth started to get pointed. The Uchiha will take appropriate action. Claws burst through the tips of his black gloves and dug deeply into the branch he was perched on. Thank you. A growl burned in the back of his throat and his skin felt itchy. It is no trouble. It is the duty of the Uchiha clan to deal with such problems. And we will do our duty. They most certainly would not. He'd kill them first. He had his kunai again, with proper paper to hold his seals, and he could kill them in an instant. It would be so easy. All he had to do was throw two kunai from his hiding place and he could neutralize Fugaku and Kashoku in the blink of an eye, and then warp across the village or across the whole country to escape. No one could stop him. If he took his kunai with him afterwards, there was a good chance that no one would ever know who did it. He reached into his secondary kunai pouch and grasped the paper-wrapped handle of one of his tri-blade kunai. The earbud which had fallen out of his left ear when he'd shifted them and now dangled by his neck let out a burst of static as some other umbu keyed their radio, 
probably accidentally. Even though it wasn't directly in his ear, it still hurt his eardrums due to his heightened hearing. He clutched at his furry canine ears, bit his tongue to keep from yelping, and almost fell out of the tree. What was that? What was what? I thought I heard something. Probably some bird or squirrel. Would you like some sake? No thank you, Uchiha-san. I have a few other places I would like to visit today and I wish to keep my head clear. Mangetsu shuddered and fumbled with his radio, switching it from a neutral frequency to turning it off completely. His ears throbbed for a few minutes and he grimaced at the taste of his own blood in his mouth from where he'd bitten his tongue. He stared down at his hands for a moment before he struggled to regain his composure. Killing them is not my assignment, he firmly reminded himself. One is shielded by diplomatic power, and the other is the head of one of the great clans. I can't kill either of them without Hokage-sama's express orders to do so. The wolf in him still burned to kill them, though. Or, at the very least, intimidate them out of doing anything that threatened his pack. It didn't matter that the threat wasn't imminent the human mind imagined it and the wolf reacted to that and the emotional stress that came with the imagining. It was one of the downsides of being a werewolf that most people didn't know about. Not long after the curse had taken hold of him, the way that he thought had subtly started to change. Even before his first transformation he'd start thinking like a wolf, especially when he was under stress. And after his first change it had only gotten worse. His thought of the people closest to him as his pack and he defended them without a thought. He had to cling to tree branches or railings to keep himself from interfering in his students' fights when they weren't faring well. And sometimes he couldn't quite catch himself from speaking up in defense of his sensei or girlfriend when he caught a snatch of unfair gossip while walking down the street. Naruto, as his offspring, was packed by virtue of being his offspring. It didn't matter that he'd never laid eyes on the child before or smelled his scent or heard his voice or held the boy in his arms. He'd felt Naruto move in Kushina's womb and he'd dreamed of his child for years and if anyone dared threaten. Don't think about it, he told himself as he worked to pay attention to the tail end of Fugaku's informal meeting. Kashoka wasn't able to say if the Naruto in the picture is my Naruto. It could be some other boy with that name. I need to focus on my job. However, as soon as his shift at following Byakucha Kashoka was over and he reported to Hokage-sama on his activities, he wasn't going to leave until this was cleared up. Uzumaki Kenjiro was starting to see why his grandfather, one of the previous leaders of Clan Uzumaki, may have committed suicide. With every passing day Clan Kurohi was revealed to be doing things or planning things that put their village in grave danger. Yet, even after his son Kenshin had brought back horrifying information on what a large faction of the shadows were doing off on the islet, the leaders of clans Furikawa and Hoshitama were reluctant to do anything rash or drastic. They wanted to try and persuade some of the more neutral leaning clans onto their side so that they could eventually get enough of a majority to overrule clan Kurohi's dangerous ambitions. Their three clans combined were far too weak to go up against the other seven clans of the village and their village was too small and weak to survive a civil war. And now Mito had come to him with more bad news. Akanahanin had managed to infiltrate as a no Sato and saw the truth hidden by their walls. The Hokage of Kanahagakur no Sato also now knew this secret. And Anuzunin had been sent to Kanaha to represent the village, but Clan Uzumaki, and Clans Hoshitama and Furikawa, too, hadn't approved him. Kenjiro slumped in his armchair and glowered at the older-looking woman who sat across from him and sipped at a cup of tea. When he'd been young and his father had still been alive, Uzumaki Mito had been pointed out to him one day. The reason that she was a gardener, his father told him, was that the village resented her. They felt that she could have lessened the great slaughter through her human husband, and so she had voluntarily refused the position of clan elder that her age and seniority should have earned her. At the time, he hadn't had much of an opinion on her, and with her low, almost invisible, profile he'd nearly forgotten about her completely. But now he decided that he hated her. So what am I supposed to do about this? He growled. Please, Mito-sama, enlighten me. You are the leader of our clan, Mito responded calmly. What do you want to do about this? He wanted to strangle her. It doesn't seem like I can do anything. He groused. Clan Uzumaki is too small to do anything alone and the Furikawa and Hoshitama aren't interested in doing anything overt. Hmm. 
The old woman sipped at her tea and looked thoughtful for a minute. It is my understanding that when this village was first founded that the plan was that once our population was rebuilt and the memories of the Cuban Oyoko had faded that we would reveal ourselves and live openly again. Our village is still too small, and now it is divided, Kenjiro retorted. The village council would never agree to do that, especially not with Clan Kurohi now holding the most prestige. The Hokage already knows, Mito reminded him. Now would be a good opportunity to distance our clan from the Kurohi and the clans under their sway, and offer ourselves up as an ally. Why didn't you just kill this Jiraiya in the first place instead of letting him go? He demanded. Jiraiya is important to Kanaha and personally important to the current Hokage, she answered. If I had killed him, he would have been missed, and missed quickly. I am sure that he'd already sent a message back to his leader before revealing himself. And even if he hadn't, the Hokage already had some suspicions. How? Kenjiro snarled. Did Kushina make another mistake beyond her terrible taste in boyfriends and birth control? Naruto-kun is in Kanaha and he couldn't keep himself a secret, even though he tried, she told him. The boy ended up there purely by chance, and the Hokage couldn't help but notice how he differs from the usual werewolf. It seems that the boy has even inherited the ability to generate Kitsune by. In Arikami damn it to hell, Kenjiro huffed as he swiftly developed a migraine. Tell me, Kenjiro-sama, Mito murmured between sips of her tea. Do you approve of the things that Clan Kurohi is doing? The treaties with dangerous demons, the dealings with Oto, the Biyakuchi in Kanaha, the bite breeding of werewolves with innocent Uzu civilians. No, of course not. Kenjiro snapped hotly. He took his village's oath to defend the human civilians of Uzu no Kuni very seriously, and what the Kurohi and their shadow puppets were doing to them was an absolute betrayal of their village's promise. Then prove to Hokage-sama that we are different from them, she advised. Biyaku Chikashoku does not represent our clan, so send someone who does. I suppose you have someone in mind. He growled sourly. I do, she smiled kindly. But you won't like it. I hate you, he said. A lot of people do, the old gardener shrugged and reached for the teapot sitting on the small table beside her chair. More tea. Sarutobi sat in his more private office, a smaller room than his public office that had no windows and the walls were laced with layers of sound-blocking seals, and listened intently as Mangetsu gave his report on Biyaku Chikashoku's movements and dealings. The Uzunin had visited several of Kanaha's major clans, introduced himself, and taken steps to ingratiate himself to them. After breakfast he visited the Aburame, then the Senjo, and at lunch he saw the Uchiha, then the Inuzuka, and just after dinner he paid a visit to the Yamanaka before spending an hour at a bar and then returning to his accommodations for the night. Mangetsu faithfully gave accounts of the Uzunin's conversations and interactions. Kashoku's words with Fugaka were very troubling and Sarutobi made a mental note to make sure that when Naruto returned from the forest of death that he had an umbu trailing him for protection. Or perhaps he should send Naruto out of the village for his training in the break between the forest of death and the public demon slayings in the village stadium that made up the final trial. Jiraiya is still in Uzu, and probably will be for a while longer. If several of Kakashi's students advance to the final trial then. Hokage-sama, Mangetsu piped up politely. I would like to know about the boy that Fugaku and Kashoka were discussing. The Hokage had expected some question from the Umbu about the subject but he was impressed that Mangetsu had gone through his whole report before asking. Before we get to him, the old man said as he pulled out several of Jiraiya's original messages from Uza that he'd stored in a secured drawer, I'd like you to read these. The Umbu hesitantly accepted the scraps of paper and schemed them. And then he read them more closely, several times. Then he pulled off his canine mask, without asking for permission to, first, and read them again disbelief and shock clearly written on his uncovered face. I, this can't, I don't. Sarutobi felt bad as he watched the younger man grapple with the revelation that his girlfriend and the mother of his child wasn't human and never had been. However, this knowledge was necessary for his understanding of why the Hokage had failed to mention Naruto earlier. The old man would have liked to space out Kushina's true nature and Naruto presence in the village so that Minato could better deal with the information, but Fugaku's plotting had thwarted that. It, it can't be true. Jiraiya would not lie about this, and certainly not to me, the Hokage responded. 
The blonde shinobi finally tore his eyes away from the scrawled messages, visibly distraught. Why? There were a lot of whys he could be asking. Why tell him that all Izunin were Kitsune when he'd asked about Naruto? Why did Kushina, a Kitsune, choose to involve herself with him, a werewolf? Why did he have to be involved in such a mess? I told you this for two reasons, Sarutobi said. I would like you to be extremely cautious in dealing with any Uzunin from now on. A lot of what Jiraiya is uncovering seems to contradict the old knowledge on Kitsune. The old man leaned over his desk and retrieved the messages from Minato's hand. And the reason that I didn't mention Naruto to you earlier is that he displays a mixture of werewolf and Kitsune traits. At the time it wasn't known that Kushina was a Kitsune, so there was a very real chance that Naruto wasn't related to you at all and it would be cruel to get your hopes up only to learn that he was not your son. It had also been cruel not to mention the boy at all to Minato before, the Hokage knew, but he was sure that it was the lesser evil. A, hybrid. Minato fidgeted with his umbu mask before setting it on Hiruzen's desk before he dropped it. He's not just a Hanyua. Naruto has admitted to being sensitive to silver, a very clear non-kitsune trait, the Hokage answered. And he is strongly affected by the full moon. It's hard to determine whether his shape-shifting abilities have more to do with being a werewolf or a half-kitsune. The boy is tight-lipped and skittish when it comes to discussing his origins. I'm sure that he was threatened before he was sent away from Uzushiagaku or Nosato. And he would have further motivation to keep quiet with Kushina being a fox demon. To keep her safe he wouldn't think it would be a good idea to tell demon hunters about her. Minato stared off into space for a few minutes before speaking again. So, Kushina arranged for Naruto to come here in secret. No, not exactly, the Hokage replied with a sad shake of his head. The old man outlined Naruto's expulsion from the fox village through his meandering through the foster care system of the Land of Fire to his arrival and belated discovery in Kanaha as best as he could with the information that was known. It pained him to watch Minato's face as every unhappy detail increased the younger man's anguish. When Hiruzen was finished, the werewolf shinobi almost looked like he'd shrunk. I should have come back sooner, Minato muttered dully. As soon as I learned how to regain human form I should have. How were you to know what was going to happen? The Hokage asked. You didn't know that Kushina was a kitsune, did you? Minato shook his head. So how could you have known how badly her people would receive Naruto? The old man frowned. Considering how limited the Kitsune population appears to be, one would think that they would be willing to overlook his werewolf traits. Minato sighed deeply and ran a hand over his face. Can I, see him? Currently he is in the forest of death undertaking the trials, Sarutobi told him. And I feel I should warn you, he does not like you and blames you for getting him disowned. I figured that he might, the younger shinobi said with a faint, bitter smile. Could, could I get a picture? The Hokage nodded and rifled through his drawers until he found Naruto's secret file that detailed all of the boy's unusual traits, removed the boy's photograph, and handed it to the werewolf Umbu. Go home, Minato, the old man said, as he rearranged some papers in his desk drawer. We'll talk more about Naruto tomorrow evening. Hi, Hokage-sama. Minato muttered as he slipped the picture into his weapon pouch and put his mask back on. Good night. When the umbu had departed, the old man sighed and started securing his secondary office so that he could return home in time to have dinner with his wife and grandson. I really hate my job sometimes. Minato was overwhelmed to the point of numbness when he returned home. His old apartment had long been rented to someone else after that full moon had outed him as a werewolf, so the Hokage had granted him a new residence. Instead of setting him up with an apartment, he'd been given the keys to a small house in a quiet civilian neighborhood. It had been vacant for a long time and needed a lot of cleaning and furnishing. After his first visit to the house, he entered and exited via his hyration instead of the doors or windows to keep the neighbors thinking that the house was empty. He stripped out of his umbu attire, took a quick shower, and dressed for bed but didn't head to his room immediately. Instead, he wandered around the ground floor aimlessly. The kitchen had all the necessary appliances and furniture, but the living room was bare of everything but an unplugged television set in a stack of boxes. In addition to the house, he'd been provided with all the supplies he could need. There was a box of umbu gear, a box of Jounin-style ninja clothing, 
a box of civilian clothing, boxes of weapons, seal paper, and reference books, and a box that had framed copies of photographs pulled from the village archives. The top pictures he'd seen when he'd opened the cardboard box was his team photo when he'd been the genin and when he'd been the sensei. He didn't bother to unpack the pictures and set them up. They were painful reminders of his old teammates, who had died on the same night that he'd been cursed, and of his students, two of which were now deceased. And even though his sensei and Kakashi were still alive, he couldn't contact them without permission and without compromising his umbu identity. So he left them, and whatever pictures might be underneath, hidden in the box. Eventually he decided to brew some tea, and while the water was heating up on the stove he took out Naruto's picture and studied it. Naruto had his hair, that much was instantly obvious. The boy's eyes were the same color as his own, but the way that they were set in his face, and the shape of his face, made him think of Kushina. The whisker-like markings were odd but sort of cute, and an indication of his Hanyu status. His clothing looked bizarre, at least, what Minato could see of it, with a thick white collar, blue shoulders, and a bit of bright orange. Naruto was smiling almost smugly at the camera as his picture had been taken. My son. His eyes watered and no matter how he wiped at them more moisture leaked out. After a minute he just gave up and started to cry. Naruto was alive and here and someday soon he'd get a glimpse of him in the flesh and learn his voice and his personality, and he was so relieved and happy. It didn't matter if his child hated him or that he had no idea how he felt about Kushina being a fox demon instead of a human. My son. Naruto was alive. Kushina trudged up the stairs to her room, ready for bed. After the old gardener had snapped her out of her funk, she'd arranged a meeting of her own with Jiraiya outside of the village. He had confirmed her suspicions that the tracking seal painted on her shoulder wasn't removable without alerting the clan elders. And she'd been frustrated at how little else Jiraiya had been able to tell her about Naruto. I need to get to Naruto, she fumed. I need to fix Naruto's skewed perception of Minato. Naruto needs to hear all the good things, and he needs to hear them from me. Jiraiya had offered to smuggle letters to her son, but that wouldn't do. Naruto was like her, not much of a reader, and she wasn't much of a writer so letters wouldn't work. While her son might ignore what other people said, he would listen to her. But how? I can't go there, he can't come here, and there aren't any phone lines between here and Kanaha. So. When she opened the door to her bedroom, she was startled to see her father waiting there for her. Since she hadn't seen him at dinner, she'd thought that he was off dining with friends or whatever. He looked almost haggard and very cranky. What? She snapped. Take your shirt off, her father grunted. What? She squawked. He glared at her until she hesitantly complied. Her father walked around behind her while she stood there wearing only her pants and bra and put his hand on the back of her right shoulder. There was a sudden sharp and burning pain and then he removed his hand. Ow. She hissed and grasped at her shoulder. What? The tracking seal was gone. I have an assignment for you, he grumbled and shoved her shirt back at her. An assignment. Kushina frowned and covered herself up again. What if I don't want to do it? Although she trained often and at times obsessively, she hadn't gone out in the field as a kunoichi since returning to Azashiagakur to have Naruto. Most missions required that she leave the country and with her tracking seal that was impossible. And the missions that didn't involve extensive travel didn't interest her. Even if they had been interesting jobs, she wouldn't have taken them. It was one of her ways of scorning her village. You'll want to do it, her father said. Trust me. Chapter 23, Out of the Forest Naruto's eyes snapped open and he felt a profound sense of relief that it had all been a dream. The giant demon skull hadn't eaten him. Evil demon chakra hadn't consumed him. He hadn't been turned into a powerless puppet that chased the Oto Genin like rabbits and wanted to do awful things to Sakura-chan. It had all been a dream, a horrible, horrible nightmare, not real, whatever it was. And then his tongue brushed up against one of his fangs, and his fingers flexed so that the tips of his claws poked his palms, and every muscle in his body burned like he'd been training non-stop for three days. Waking up with fangs and claws wasn't too unusual. Really bad nightmares would get him to shift a little bit, but he never got anywhere near full animal. Waking up feeling like he'd run for days, though, had never happened before. Whatever, 
I'll worry about it later. He glanced around cautiously and his dark surroundings made him think that he was still in the giant fox demon's mouth for a moment. Then he rolled over and spied Sasuke laid out on the ground a yard away. And beyond him, backlit by the grey morning light, he saw Sakura sitting at the entrance of the not-toothy cave. Naruto hurriedly rolled onto his side so that his back was facing his female teammate. Okay, time to lose the foxy features before Sakura-chan sees them. It took longer than it usually did to shrink his fangs, blunt his nails, and take care of his ears, eyes, and the exaggerated marks on his face. And it hurt a little bit, too, which wasn't normal. The worst his transformations felt was rather uncomfortable, and only when he went all the way from human to beast. He brushed the oddness aside. Now that he was back with his team, they could get out of this damn forest. So he sat up. Ow ow ow. Moving made his body feel like one big bruise, and the force of gravity seemed to have doubled making it that much harder to sit up. Naruto. Hmm. Naruto grunted, squinting at his female teammate. Sakura looked tired and pale, which made the bruises that dotted her skin all the more noticeable. She regarded him with a wariness that quickly started to make him nervous. Why was she looking at him like she was afraid of him? Are, are you okay now? The pink-haired girl squeaked. I feel really crappy, but I'll be okay, the blonde boy replied. You sure? Sakura asked, hesitantly crawling closer. Oh. The girl suddenly relaxed. You're back to normal now. Huh. Naruto blinked as a chill of unease P.R.I.C. cling over his skin. Yesterday, it was like you were a demon, she told him with a shiver. You had fangs and claws in your eyes, and and you were covered in this awful chakra that Lee San said came out of the huge demon skull. That, wasn't a dream. Naruto felt cold. Oh shit. You don't remember that? His female teammate asked. Naruto frantically shook his head, jumping on the opportunity to play dumb. Oh. Sakura turned away from him and crawled over to Sasuke's side. It was really awful. I'm glad that you're back to normal now. With Sakura's attention off him, Naruto took a moment to be thoroughly horrified. It hadn't just been a dream. It had been real. He'd been the helpless puppet of the apparently undead Kuba no Yoko. The dead fox demon had really offered him the opportunity to rid himself of his lycanthropy tainted human blood forever. That was tempting. Very, very tempting. But would he be able to survive without all of that human blood? And what sort of price would the wicked skeleton demand for its help? He thought of the glimpse of the demon he had seen while it had used him, and how it had delighted in the fear and the pain and the suffering of both Naruto's enemies and of his friends, and shuddered. The Kyuubi is too evil, he thought, nibbling at his lower lip. But if I could find someone else that could do the same thing. I could live with mom again. Sasuke-kun, please wake up. Naruto blinked and turned his attention to his two teammates. Sasuke was still out cold and hadn't so much as moved. Sakura knelt beside him and looked close to tears. Is something wrong with him? Naruto asked. That Kusanin who summoned the snakes, was a man, she answered, wringing her hands. When he and Sasuke kun fought, the man he called himself Orochimaru did something to him, bit him. He hasn't woken up since. He bit Sasuke. Naruto frowned and stiffly crawled over and looked where Sakura gestured to see the wound for himself. There was an odd mark at the juncture of the Uchiha's neck and shoulder. It was hard to see as it was practically on his back, but it wasn't like any scar that the blonde boy had ever seen. He thought it looked more like a sharing an inspired tattoo. What the heck, an evil hickey. Naruto. Sakura snapped, appalled. Be serious. That mark is doing something to him maybe killing him. If he doesn't wake up soon. Let's get him to the tower, then, Naruto said. I'm sure they'll have doctors there. But if we go there with only one box, we'll fail, she protested. And if we fail, Sasuke-kun will be so upset. Better than him being dead. Naruto snorted and unzipped his jacket. He grimaced when he found the remaining rice cakes smushed into a bag full of crumbs, but his white dotted box was perfectly intact. Besides, we won't fail unless the bastard dies or some other team catches us. What the how did you get that? The girl squawked. 
I stole it from a waterfall team, he grinned smugly. Then his expression turned worried. This is the one we needed, right? Yes, she nodded and pulled out their original box identical to the one that Naruto had acquired except for the black circle painted on the lid. Cool, let's go then. He declared and lurched to his feet. And then collapsed back to the dirt as his knees gave out. As soon as my legs start working again. As teammate jugged towards the tower, both necessary boxes in hand, Hinata kept sneaking glances at Kiba. For a few days now he'd been acting strangely. He'd act like he had stomach aches, but when asked he would deny being sick. He was more short-tempered than usual and recently his personality had shifted to downright nasty. Even Akamaru seemed wary of him now and no longer rode on Kiba's head or in his jacket. Shino didn't seem terribly concerned. He weathered Kiba's outbursts like he always did and focused purely on the task at hand. And since they were so close to completing this part of the trials, Hinata was inclined to let it slide, too. But, when they'd tangled with a pair of Kusanin who'd lost a team member and was desperately looking for her, she'd seen something. She'd had her Byakugan active so that she could steal their box while Kiba and Shino fought them. In the process, she'd gotten a look at Kiba and saw something shadowy and indistinct lurking near the heart of his chakra coils. She'd wanted to take a second, more purposeful look, but it would be an invasion of his privacy. One of the last things she ever wanted to do was use her Kekai Genkai irresponsibly. And to ask him for his permission to look, it was just too embarrassing. She would never be able to get the words out before he brushed her off. It had only been a glance, and her eyes weren't terribly skilled, so it probably hadn't been anything. Probably. Hinata glanced over at him again and noticed his pale skin and the dark circles under his eyes and bit her lip worriedly. Kiba could. When Sasuke woke up, the first thing he saw was a blue shoulder, a white collar, and a patch of spiky yellow hair. There was a pair of arms looped behind his knees, holding him up against a back. He smelled stale sweat, unwashed hair, dirt, leaves, and the faintest scent of ramen broth. Naruto was carrying him. Sasuke immediately struggled free of Naruto's grasp and landed on the ground in an undignified heap. Sasuke-kun, you're alive. Sakura cried in relief. Great, Naruto sighed. He was getting really heavy. The Uchiha propped himself up on his elbows and glanced around warily. He didn't recognize his surroundings at all. Judging from the angle of the meager rays of sunlight that pierced the forest canopy it was sometime in the early afternoon. Sasuke-kun, how are you feeling? Sakura asked, getting right in his face. Fine, Sasuke grunted and leaned away from her ignoring the dull throbbing from his bite wound. How long have I been out? Almost three days now, she said, giving him a bit more space but still looking very worried. Sasuke gritted his teeth in dismay. Being out for three days meant that there was only two days to complete this part of the trials. That left a much smaller possibility of success. If they didn't locate a team with the right box quickly. Relax, bastard. Naruto snickered. We've got the boxes that we need and we're almost to the tower. All we have to do is get there without getting caught and we're set. Right, Sakura nodded. So let's hurry. Can you walk, Sasuke-kun? The Uchiha boy was slow to react to her question. He was stuck on the fact that he'd been unconscious for days and his two teammates had somehow acquired a second box of the correct type without him. The orange-clad moron and annoying fangirl had done everything while he'd done nothing but be a load to be carried. Sasuke-kun. With a growl Sasuke staggered to his feet. Let's go already. He failed to notice how deeply relieved both of his teammates sounded as they agreed with him. How can I ever tell my father about this? Kenjiro sat in the dragon room of the hidden lotus tea house and sipped at his small glass of sake, hoping that the sweet rice wine would dull the almost constant headache he now suffered with. The elders of his clan were seething with what he'd done unleashing a young, defiant girl who had proven to have very bad judgment. And the leaders of the only two clans that he could call his allies weren't any happier. Are you mad, Kenjiro? Hoshitama Morimaru, head of clan Hoshitama, and his grandfather-in-law, barked, knitting together his bushy eyebrows in displeasure. This reeks more of the impulsive act of a youngster, Furikawa Sato, head of clan Furikawa, snorted. 
One of the Uzumaki elders should have come out of retirement instead of letting a fox so young ascend to leadership. Of course Sato would have that opinion. He was over 300 years old, a survivor of the Great Slaughter, while Kenjiro was barely 70. And Morimaru was likely to agree with Sato, being almost 200, himself. I think the question isn't whether I am mad, but are you? Kenjiro countered. Do you honestly believe your strategy of slowly trying to wrest control away from Clan Kurohi will succeed? And succeed in time to do any real good? There is no other realistic option, Sato replied. Now call that loose cannon you call your daughter back before she succeeds in making us truly extinct. I know my great-granddaughter has her problems, but please don't call her that, Sato, Morimaru muttered with a frown. Considering what she's already done, there are far worse things that I could call her, Sato retorted. The lines in Morimaru's face deepened, but he didn't say anything in response. Kenjiro refilled his glass and swirled the liquid around for a moment before tossing it back. There is no other realistic option. The Uzumaki leader repeated and locked eyes with the white-haired Sato. Is that what all the old clan leaders thought as the Cuban no Yoko dug our race's collective grave with his madness and murder and they stood by and did nothing? Don't you dare judge us you whose parents weren't even a sparkle in the eye at the time. Sato hissed, his human face reddening with rage. How were we supposed to foresee that the humans would be too stupid and petty to bother discerning a guilty fox from an innocent one? The Cuban no Yoko nearly toppled several important countries' governments through murders and intrigues and you see their response as an overreaction. Kenjiro spat. You think that they would care about our guilt or innocence when the stability of the entire continent hung in the balance, and all they saw of us was what the Cuban and his cronies did? No one clan could go up against him and his followers. Sato protested. And no clans trusted one another enough to form an alliance against him. There was nothing to do but hope that the humans were strong enough to deal with him. The Furikawa leader chuckled bitterly. And, unfortunately, they were. Ke, leaving the humans to clean up our mess, Kenjiro grimaced in disgust. Perhaps we deserved what happened. The Cuban no Yoko was just as much the fault of the humans as he was ours, Sato snapped. In fact, our only contribution to the Cubia's crimes is that we did nothing to stop him once he started. His vendetta against the human race is completely their own creation. Can we please stop casting blame? Morimaru sighed, removing his spectacles to polish them on his sleeve. It accomplishes nothing. Very true, Kenjiro agreed. Casting blame and burying your heads in the sand while Clan Kurohi runs rampant accomplishes nothing good at all. That mongrel clan looks to be gearing up for something devious. I personally think they aim to start a war, but when or with whom I can't begin to guess. It may be rash and reckless, but I've made my choice. Feel free to join me in throwing my clan at the Hokage's mercy or stand aside and wait, I don't care. I can't stand aside and allow clan Kurohi's actions tarnish my clan's name outside of this village in the human realm. I won't. Sato glowered at him like an angry parent disgusted by a child's selfish behavior. Morimaru looked worried and fearful while trying to project anger as he fidgeted with the white tip of his bushy tail. Kenjiro used his chopsticks to select a piece of sushi from the large tray laid in the middle of the table and munched on it. Um, if I may bring up another subject. Morimaru asked, his quiet voice loud in the still, tense air. Please, change the subject. Sato growled, and skewered a sushi roll with his own chopsticks. Have either of your clans had young pups disappear? The Hoshi Tamil leader asked. No, Sato said with a concerned frown. Kenjiro shook his head and leaned forward. Why do you ask? A few days ago, one of my great-grandnephew's young sons went out to play and never came home, Morimaru explained. We've asked the neighboring clans for help, but haven't gotten much response. He still hasn't turned up, dead or alive. That was very troubling. Children were the most precious thing in their village. Every new child born was another life towards their goal of restoring their race in a more certain future. If a child of any clan went missing, the neighbors should be just as eager to help as the clan that had lost the child in the first place. As Kenjiro thought of what clan districts neighbored clan Hashidamas, he remembered that one was clan Kurohi. I don't like this at all. Naruto grinned wearily as he followed his teammates into the cool, 
dark entrance at the base of the tower at the heart of the forest of death. They'd made it and as soon as they did whatever they had to do with the boxes to complete this phase of the trials they would be out of here. Even though he felt exhausted, this success had him feeling giddy. It hadn't been easy. The path they'd taken to the tower had been blocked by a creepy-looking Aemnon team. To get past them without risking their hard-won prizes, Naruto had generated a trio of Kage Bunshin and transformed two of them into his teammates. To ensure that they lasted long enough for Team 7 to make it to safety, Naruto had had to pump a lot of chakra into them so that Sasuke had almost had to carry him. But it had worked like a charm. The blonde boy stumbled after Sasuke and Sakura until they came to a massive set of double doors that halted their progress. There were no handles on the doors, just a sunken circle in one of the panels, and no matter how Naruto pulled and shoved at them they wouldn't budge. When he gave up on that, he turned to see his teammates standing by a table set off to the side. Is there something over there that'll open the doors? Naruto asked as he trudged over to them. Sasuke flashed him an irritated look, but didn't answer. All Sakura said was, maybe. Naruto pouted and looked at the table. There were two circles of seals painted on the tabletop one with a white circle painted in the middle, and the other with a black circle. After tracing her fingertips over the designs, Sakura pulled out both of their boxes and matched up the circles on the lids with the ones set in the table. Pop. Pop. The seal papers that sealed the lids shut abruptly popped off. Sakura reached for the black box and started to open it. Hey. Naruto protested. Didn't that crazy proctor lady say not to open the boxes? This table is set up specifically to open these boxes, idiot, Sasuke grumbled. And since there's no clear way to open the doors in advance, there must be something in these boxes that will get the doors to open. Hmm, <laughs> Sakura hummed as she pulled a black wavy half circle with a white dot on the fatter end. It was flat and metallic with some ridges and bumps on the unpainted side. When she opened the white box, she pulled out the same thing only it was white with a little black dot. The pink-haired girl fit the two things together to form a full circle, glanced over at the door, and smiled broadly. I've got it. She hurried over to the door and stood in front of the sunken circle in the door. Sakura shoved the two black and white pieces into the hole and twisted them until there was an audible click. As she backed up, the completed yin-yang symbol spun around a few times and then the double doors slowly creaked inwards. Cool, Naruto breathed in awe as the way opened for them. When the doors had completely opened, the crazy purple-haired woman in the trench coat walked towards them, flanked by a pair of chunin. Hey there, maggots. She grinned crookedly. You made it, and with time to spare too. Lucky you. Until the test is over for everyone, you're stuck here. But don't worry, this tower has everything you need from rooms to sleep into food to eat and all the good essentials in between, so enjoy it while you can. Now, any of you need a doctor before we give you the grand tour. Sasuke got an evil hickey from some snake freak Orochimaru guy, Naruto announced cheerfully. Does he need to get a shot for that? He'd meant it as a joke. But from the way that the bored looking proctor suddenly went deathly pale, he figured that she didn't find it the least bit funny. She rushed over to Sasuke and quickly found the creepy black mark at the base of the Uchiha's neck. Shit. She cursed. Take him downstairs, she said, shoving Sasuke towards one of her chunin helpers. You alert the umbu, she told the other and then sprinted off towards the forest. I'm going after him. Anko, wait. One of the chunin shouted, but she was already gone. Cursing, both chunin dashed off to complete their tasks, one taking Sasuke with him. That left Naruto and Sakura completely alone at the gates. Sasuke kun. The girl mumbled worriedly, her green eyes fixed in the direction that her crush had been dragged off to. Naruto shifted nervously from foot to foot before he latched to an idea. I'm hungry, he complained and started off towards a set of stairs leading upwards that he saw. Let's go find some food. Naruto. The girl squeaked, hey, wait. Minato was glad to have a few days off duty. He had a lot to think about and he knew he wouldn't be able to focus on his work. So he sat in his kitchen and sipped at a cup of coffee and looked at a handful of photographs while he thought. After a fitful night's sleep, he'd gone back to the Hokage as soon as possible to find out more about Naruto. Hiruzen had been expecting him and patiently went over everything that was known about the boy. 
He provided the boy's official team photograph, seeing that Kakashi was Naruto's teacher made him smile, described his son's abilities, and did his best to answer all of Minato's questions. So, you say that his animal form more closely resembles a fox than a wolf. That is how it's been described to me. I really need to arrange for it to be photographed so that Umbu won't mistake him for some other creature. And, he smells more like a fox than a wolf. That is what Kakashi tells me. So, could that, was he the odd fox-like creature I described in my debriefing? Yes, unless there was some other checkers playing slowly dying werewolf skulking around Kanaha. He finished off his cup of coffee and sighed. He regretted that he hadn't tried to speak with Naruto before. But he'd been so afraid that his attempts at communication might not be understood, he wasn't sure if foxes were closely enough related to understand him the way that dogs could, and could frighten away the only company that he'd had, that he hadn't risked trying. So many missed opportunities, he sighed. If only I'd known that Kushina was a kitsune it might have crossed my mind that he was Naruto. But I know now, and as soon as he gets out of the forest of death I'll have plenty of time to make up for it. A knock at his kitchen window distracted him and he looked up to see the feline masked Yamato perched on the sill. Suit up, you're needed. Chapter 24, Lost Children Sasuke did his best not to fidget as he waited with the chunin in some dimly lit chamber that was down several flights of stairs under the tower in the forest of death. He wasn't sure if the space had been a cave modified into a room or a room that had been constructed to look like a cave. The Uchiha didn't like being down there at all, but was determined not to show it. He didn't see what the big deal was about the mark on his neck. It throbbed awfully and since he'd woken up he'd had a bit of trouble molding Chakra properly, but other than that it hadn't done a thing to him. So was it really necessary to drag him down to this almost dungeon? And what was going to happen to him now? The radio in the Chunin's hand crackled and the man brought it to his ear to listen. Whatever he heard through the static appeared to relieve him. He hooked the radio to his belt and looked expectantly towards one of the darkened entryways. A pair of Umbu materialized out of the shadows, silent as ghosts. The only parts of that that weren't covered by black cloth or white armor were their upper arms where their tattoos were inked, and the hair on the tops of their heads. One had a red-tinged feline mask and brown hair, and the other had a black-marked canine mask and blonde hair. Sasuke couldn't help but shiver a bit. Umbu always creeped him out on the rare occasion that he saw any of them. They were so quiet and the masks that they wore were deceptively innocent looking. Umbu-san, the Chunin greeted with a bow. Thank you for arriving so promptly. This is the boy afflicted with the curse seal. Curse seal? Sasuke thought with a hint of panic. What sort of curse? Has the curse seal been activated? The canine masked Umbu asked. The Uchiha boy was struck by how similar the masked man's hair was to Naruto's it was just a touch darker and somewhat longer. The mask the Umbu wore was just as unnerving as any other Umbu mask. The black moon crescent on the brow and the dark eye holes felt horribly ominous. And then he realized that the Umbu had been asking him not the chin in that question. I don't know, Sasuke muttered. That would be a no then, the elite shinobi replied. Show it to me. Sasuke hesitantly tugged at the collar of his shirt and turned so that the man could see the mark on the back of his shoulder. The Umbu ran a gloved fingertip over it, and then probed it with a bit of chakra. That hurt and the boy reflexively threw a punch to make him stop, but the masked man easily caught his fist and didn't stop probing until he was satisfied of something. You're lucky, Uchiha-san, the Umbu remarked. Had the seal activated even once you'd be much worse off than you are. Shock at this information kept Sasuke quiet until after the Umbu had given his cat-masked companion some instructions about seal paper, kunai, and a sealing circle. What do you mean by that? The young Uchiha asked unable to keep the fearful strain out of his voice. He reached over his shoulder and gripped at the tainted mark on his skin. What is this thing? It is exactly what it sounds like, a curse seal, the canine Umbu said as he started to trace a circle on the floor with one of his blades. It corrupts the victim with every activation it makes them faster and stronger, at the price of their sanity and self-control. Sasuke chewed at the inside of his cheek. It could make me stronger and faster. Don't you even think it, the blonde Umbu snapped, startling the Uchiha. There are five known cases of ninja surviving being branded with Orochimaru's curse seal, 
and of those five there is only one still alive. The other four had to be eliminated due to seal-induced insanity. They became violent, paranoid, delusional, attacked their own comrades for no reason, and one even killed a client. It is a curse because the price is far too steep, and it can never be removed, as far as anyone can tell. If it can't be removed, then what are you doing? Sasuke demanded. I will be sealing it away so that it cannot spontaneously activate when you suffer any extreme emotional disturbance, the umbu explained calmly as he took some seal papers from his friend, sliced his bare arm, and started writing symbols in his own blood. However, this seal that I will give you is dependent on your own will. If you give in to the temptation to use the curse's power, my seal will not be able to stop you. And should you try to exceed your limits and expend more chakra than you have, the seal will also fail, allowing the curse to corrupt you and taint your mind, if it doesn't kill you outright. The genin chewed this over as the umbu continued to work. After tying the marked seal papers to kunai handles and arranging them around the circle on the ground, he had Sasuke take his shirt off and then painted more markings directly on the boy's skin. It was creepy and felt disgusting, but Sasuke did his best to follow instructions and hold still. He would endure this if it meant keeping himself sane and free of taint. All right, the blonde umbu said as he finished his preparations and waved the chunin and other umbu back. Do your best to hold still and not fight what I'm doing. He moved his hands through a few seal positions. This may hurt just a little. Anko darted through the forest, her face a mask of determination. She probably should wait for backup, but there was no time and it just wasn't her style. Her old master was slithering about and she wasn't going to let him do the things that he'd done to her to some innocent baby Jenin. When she'd been young, she'd believed in Orochimaru's human half that it was strong and good and kept his reptile demon nature in check. He was the student of the Hokage, one of the son in one of only three ninja who had survived Hanzo the Salamander's attempt to turn a border dispute between Hai no Kuni and Aim no Kuni into a full-scale war. Orochimaru-sensei had been her role model and her master and her everything. No matter how harsh the training he set for her, she would endure it for him and excel. She'd believed in him all the way up until he'd gone rogue from Kanaha, dragged her through three countries while on the run, and then used her as a guinea pig for his curse seal formula. Anko had barely survived that experience, and the side effects of the not-quite-perfected seal had damaged her memory. As she was no longer useful to him, he'd abandoned her to wander the wilds and die. Only Namikaze Minato's rescue of her confused young self had allowed her to survive. If only he hadn't gone and turned into a werewolf the very next year. She hadn't had time to grow up and show her appreciation for him by seducing him away from whatever bland girlfriend he'd had at the time. The scent of blood and something foul caught her attention and brought her dash to a halt. Anko honed in on the source, expecting her ex-sensei to at least be the cause, if not at the heart of it. She wasn't disappointed. By the banks of one of the two streams that ran through the training ground, she found a Hoshi Genin team, or, at least what was left of it. Only the girl on the team was left alive. Her two male teammates were dead. One lay curled up in a ball, covered in slashes in his own blood. The other was sprawled on his back with a kunai driven deep into his chest and his guts exploded outwards. The girl cowered several feet away, tears rolling down her cheeks as she trembled silently. Hey. Anko grunted, crouching down by the girl and grasping her shoulders to get her attention. Hey, what happened? Something was wrong with him, the girl Jenin murmured, her watering eyes distant and unfocused. It happened the first day and it got worse and worse. He wasn't himself. We tried to help him, we tried to help him, we tried. What happened? Anko repeated, more firmly. He killed Ken, the girl whispered hoarsely. He tried to kill me, but I killed him first. She brushed back her dark curly hair with a blood-splattered hand. Something came out of him and tried to get me. Anko leaned in closer. What came out of him? It was black and terrible and it smelled like fish oil, the genin murmured, her unfocused eyes drifting off to the side. It exploded out of his guts and moved like an amoeba. It tried to get me and I electrocuted it. The special Jonin followed the Jenin's gaze and noticed an ugly black puddle that wasn't water or mud. Anko, having trained in the Forest of Death fairly often and having run this section of the trials for a few years, was familiar with all of the nasty things residing in it. 
She knew about the giant tigers and bears and beetles and spiders and the carnivorous plants that grew in the swampy patch and the acid-spitting lizards and the horned rabbits, but she'd never seen anything like that black puddle before. That's something of yours, isn't it sensei? Jiraiya sat on one of Uzu's sea cliffs and watched as the changing tides stirred up a whirlpool just offshore. It was amazing to watch, especially from a safe vantage point. The white-haired shinobi wasn't terribly keen on being a boat anywhere near the watery phenomenon. Fancy seeing you here, Jiraiya. The Kanahanin turned and found his sensei's old friend, Furikawa Kaito, picking his way over the rocky terrain. Kaito-san. He recognized his sensei's old friend, and one of Uzu's former liaisons to Kanaha. Furikawa Kaito had lived in the Leaf Village for years as a symbol of the treaty between their two ninja forces. Kaito had retired and returned to Uzu a good decade before Kushina's arrival, and as he was almost ten years older than the Hokage Jiraiya had thought that the man would be too frail to be hiking around outdoors like this. But he's from Uzu, Jiraiya realized. Everyone in Uzushiaga Kuur lives a long time, because they're Kitsune. So Hiruzen has sent one of his precious students all the way out here to see what our village is doing. Kaito murmured, fingering his mangled ear. Do you think he would ignore what he hears and sees? Jiraiya countered. No, no of course not, Kaito sighed and looked out to see in the direction that Jiraiya had moments earlier. I was just thinking out loud. So, how have you been? Well enough, Jiraiya replied, watching the man from the corner of his eyes. Considering the current state of things and how Orochimaru is a rogue med scientist and Tsunade Hime has abandoned the village and all. Good, good. Kaito was silent for a few minutes before speaking again. I suppose Clan Uzumaki has been in touch with you. Yes, Jiraiya nodded. They hold themselves apart from Uzushio, it seems. What about your clan? Clan Furikawa and Clan Hoshitama also disagree with the current direction of our village, we're just more cautious about it. The Sunin raised an eyebrow at the older man's tone. Oh. My grandfather is being far too conservative in his actions in my opinion, Kaito explained. I understand his fear about what may happen should some of our village's secrets be exposed, but the things that Clan Kurohi is doing. He shook his head. Something drastic needs to be done. And something drastic is being done. Both of them turned to see another man approaching them. Jiraiya had no idea who he was. Kaito, however, apparently was at least acquainted with him. Kenjiro-sama, Kaito greeted with a slight bow. The man, Kenjiro, barely nodded in acknowledgement of the greeting, his gray eyes fixed on Jiraiya. You are Jiraiya of the Sunin. At Jiraiya's nod, he continued. I am Uzumaki Kenjiro. You won't be able to speak with Mito-san any longer, so I'll be sending one of my sons to meet with you when necessary. Has something happened to dear old Mito? Jiraiya inquired with a slight frown. She's gone on vacation, Kenjiro said. Vacation? Kaito muttered in disbelief. At a time like this. It's the first time since she became clan gardener that she's requested any vacation time, the Uzumaki man responded. After over a century and a half of tireless service I wasn't about to reject her request. Uzumaki Kushina can't be my contact. Jiraiya asked. My daughter is on assignment, Kenjiro answered. The Kanahanin narrowed his eyes slightly. So this was Kushina's father, and Naruto's grandfather. This was the person who had abandoned Naruto in the foster system and terrified him into keeping secrets. So she's really out of the village, Kaito said. How unhappy are your clan elders? All five of them want to skin me alive, but they can't because they're too lazy or cowardly to take over my position as clan head, and there's no one else in the clan qualified to replace me. Kenjiro spat on the ground. Miserable old beasts the lot of them. How much power do they have? Jiraiya wondered. On paper, nothing, Kenjiro told him. In practice, their ability to annoy and pressure give them a measure of clout. It's even worse when other clans back up your elders, Kaito agreed. That thing with your illegitimate grandson was a nightmare. Poor kid. You have no idea, Kenjiro grumbled sourly. Oh. Jiraiya feigned ignorance. What happened? The boy, was born a werewolf, Kaito hesitantly replied. They wanted the child destroyed, for obvious reasons. 
It's a hard thing to do, no matter who the victim is, but a child, a child of your child. Even the compromise was ugly, Kenjiro grunted. Compromise. Kaito blinked. What compromise? Does the village not know that Naruto is still alive? Jiraiya wondered. Well, it was good meeting you, Jiraiya-san, Kenjiro said, completely ignoring Kaito's question. I hope you enjoy your stay in our country. And should you come across any little talking foxes, please bring them back to the village two children from Hoshitama and one from my own clan have recently gone missing and their mothers are frantic. With a polite nod, Uzumaki Kenjiro departed. Furikawa Kaito hurried after him, still wanting to know about the compromise. Jiraiya watched them go until they disappeared over a hill, and then he turned back to the offshore whirlpool that was now slowly disintegrating. I really wish I could be sure of what is going on here. Kurohi Yudai lazily twirled a ceremonial dagger with his hand as he waited for Orochimaru to appear. The current rendezvous point was one of the snake's old hidden labs an abandoned Umbu safe house and storage depot that had been left fallow for decades before the half-demon had refurbished it. After his disgrace, Kanaha had discovered it and cleaned it out, destroying whatever they couldn't easily remove. But they left the mostly underground building itself completely intact, and failed to make use of it or keep watch on it. Being half a day's hard traveling from Kanaha, it was the closest secure meeting place available. Yudai sat on a chair the only piece of furniture left with two of his most trusted shadows waiting with him. Underneath the rickety wooden chair was a large basket with a lid. Whenever he heard muffled sounds start to slip out of it, he'd kick it lightly, sometimes not so lightly, with his heel until it quieted. A scuffling sound caught his interest, but it only turned out to be a crow tengu. The black feathered demon hop fluttered to where Yudai sat and presented him with a letter. One of the shadows removed a cheap bracelet, a worthless bit of costume jewelry that glittered with numerous glass beads, and tossed it to the child-sized creature. Delighted with its pay, the Tengu caught an ugly song of joy and hurried off to add its treasure to its precious stash. It didn't care for the monetary worth of the thing, just that it sparkled. The letter was from Kashoku. To make sure that Yudai stayed in the loop, Kashoku had been instructed to send two letters every time he made a report. One letter was mailed to Azishiagakur and the other to a post office box in one of the larger villages located near Kanaha. An old shadow had been stationed in that town to act as a civilian and check the post office box. Whenever a letter arrived there, he was to get a Tengu to carry it to Yudai, wherever he was. The navy-haired Rokubai schemed the letter, easily translating its light code and ignoring the nonsense bits that made it look like a personal letter to a friend. So far Kashoku's mission was going slowly but well. He'd met all the major clan heads and some of the most influential minor ones and would soon meet with Orochimaru's mole. But one bit of news really caught Yudai's attention. Uzumaki Naruto could very well be alive and in Kanaha. There were two uses for this information that immediately sprung to his mind. It could further discredit clan Uzumaki, which had supposedly destroyed the child years ago, now they would be known as dishonorable liars in addition to being sexually depraved wolf lovers and the boy could be just the tool he needed to get the defiant Izumaki Kushina to be his mate. His desire to have the fiery vixen as his wife had no romantic basis. There was no place for romance or true love in mating for Kitsune anymore. All that mattered were good genetic matches and healthy, powerful bloodlines. For all that the Uzumaki were fools and slaves to promises, they had a lot of power in their blood and Kushina was the best source of that power and there was the added bonus of the challenge of taming the wild woman and shaping her into something obedient and loyal something that greatly appealed to him. The only obstacle to acquiring the pawn needed to win him the vixen was the Uchiha clan's desire to kill the boy. If the boy died, he couldn't blackmail Kushina into accepting his marriage proposal, but at least the boy's existence would still count against clan Uzumaki. However, should the boy avoid assassination or survive the attempt on his life? As soon as this meeting is over, I need to send Kashoku instructions to kidnap the boy if he can manage it without upsetting his inroads with the Uchiha or getting caught by Kanaha. Twenty minutes later, Orochimaru finally arrived. The half-demon almost seemed to slither as he moved, and he looked rather annoyed to see that Yudai had claimed the only chair available. Yudai rose and politely greeted his reptilian ally. I hope your adventures in the forest of death were enjoyable and fruitful, Yudai remarked after the necessary greetings were exchanged. 
Very much so, Orochimaru hissed, licking his lips. It's a pity that I wasn't able to stay for the whole test. Indeed, a pity, Yudai agreed. Hopefully my social saboteur will work quickly so that you might return to Kanaha sooner. Hopefully, Orochimaru echoed, his serpentine eyes growing sharp as they drifted over the basket tucked under the chair. Do you have something for me? I do, Yudai smiled. With a gesture, his shadows picked up the basket and held it between them before the half-snake. I know that you were very dissatisfied with the first kitsune that we provided you with. Now we have finally acquired a few more. He lifted the lid on the basket to reveal three young foxes. Two were about the size of a cat and the third was about ten pounds heavier. One was bright pink in color, the second was a pale blue, and the third and largest one was a shocking shade of green. All three were just old enough to be able to play outside without direct supervision, but too young to have any skill at shape-shifting. And all of them were muzzled so that they couldn't speak or make any sound beyond muffled whines and whimpers. One male, he tapped the cowering blue fox on the head, and two females, aged between two and five years. They should be more resilient than that last subject, and if you're patient enough to wait for them to mature you can brainwash them into being your servants or breed them. Considering how important offspring are to an endangered species, these were not easy to come by. Please accept them. Orochimaru looked tempted to drool as he reached out to remove the tiny pink fox child and examine it. Being so young, the only visible kitsune trait that it possessed was an unusual coat color, only age and training would cause new tails to grow. That was why the three children stolen were of such bright colors to prove that they were kitsune. When the half-demon experimentally removed the girl's muzzle, she immediately started to cry. Mama! She yelped loudly. Mama, I wanna go home. Mama! Mama! Noisy, aren't they? Orochimaru hissed as he put the muzzle back on and dumped her back into the basket with the other two. It's why we kept them muzzled long after it was necessary, Yudai replied. Are they more to your satisfaction than the last one? Yes, the Hanyu nodded with a wicked smile. He closed the basket and accepted it from the shadows. These subjects are much better. Your village proves its worth once again. They traded flatteries for a while longer, and then Orochimaru departed with his new pets. Yudai smirked in satisfaction even as he heard the puppies whimper while they were carried away. They weren't his children, they weren't of his clan. With how young and sheltered they were, they would be unable to tell Orochimaru anything useful about where they'd come from. They were necessary sacrifices culled from clans whose allegiance he knew was not to their cause. Yudai fingered his earring and then left the old lab with his shadows to write Kashoku some new instructions. Kushina really hated how far away Kanaha was from Uzu. She also really hated how temperamental the weather could be in the region when summer started to turn to fall. The redhead sat by the window in a small roadside inn and glowered at the heavy rain that had made her stop and wait. Rain, rain, go away, come again after I've made it to Kanaha, damn it. While she stared out the window in a sour mood, she fingered her necklace. She really hadn't needed the thing except when she was in Kanaha, but ever since she'd received it she'd always worn it out of habit. The crystal pendant and the seal-marked beads framing it were specially made by clan Hoshitama to prevent spontaneous transformation, the generation of Kitsune by, and cancelled out the flavor of fox and demon in her scent. It had originally been made for her mother, so all the excuses about why she wouldn't take it of that she'd told to her Kanaha friends hadn't really been lies. She wondered if she should have written a letter to someone in Kanaha like Mikato, warning that she was coming. But moving at ninja speed, even hampered with bad weather, she was likely to beat her own letter to the village. Still, she debated it in her head, perhaps out of guilt of not responding to some of the letters she'd been sent by old friends over the years. If she'd tried to answer them, it was likely they'd have been so heavily censored that she might as well have mailed black sheets of paper. Kushina grimaced and turned away from the window and back to her cheap dinner. The rain probably wouldn't let up until late in the night or early in the morning, so she had a while to wait. But first thing in the morning, she'd be on the road again and working to make up lost time. She needed to deliver the scroll and letter that her father had given her to the Hokage. Then she needed to find Naruto, have a good cry, and then give him a good long talk. And if she found time after that, she hoped to reconnect with old friends. Even though she'd always had to hide part of herself while in Kanaha, 
now that she finally had the opportunity to go back it felt like she was going home. Hold on, Naruto, I'll be there soon. That's it for part 8. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.